Psalm chapter 13 is where we find ourselves today. And for many of you, if you have some familiarity with the scripture, maybe you grew up in Sunday school, maybe you didn't, but you probably know the name David. And there's probably things that come to your mind immediately when we think about David, King David. And, and David, you know, we probably remember that David was just a shepherd boy that God called and that God raised up to be the best king that Israel ever had. And a lot of times with David, though we're familiar with maybe the incident with, with Bathsheba and how David tried to cover that up and the hole that he kept digging himself in deeper and deeper, we're familiar with that. But for the most part, I think that when we think of David, we think of a very just surface level. You know, David was the shepherd boy that God raised up to be king, and he lived happily ever after. But that's actually not the case at all. David's life was filled with so many ups and downs. David's life was filled with a lot of complications. Yes, it is true that David was called as a shepherd boy, and God anointed him by Samuel the prophet that he would one day sit on the throne, that he would one day be king. And what's significant about that is that, that, that David's father, David's family, the people around him, no one thought that, that David would be the guy, just a shepherd boy. And in fact, he was overlooked a lot, and yet God called him and raised him up to be king. But what we may or may not understand and realize is from the moment David was anointed to be king, over a decade passes before he actually sits on a throne. That in fact, it's almost 15 years before David sits on a throne. David, we know one of the highlights in his life is defeating Goliath. That when everyone was afraid, David fought and David faced, faced Goliath and and killed Goliath, uh, and, and, and God gave Israel great victory over the Philistines. And we think about this, that David's bold and courageous, and that everything just kind of went really well for David. But yet even after defeating Goliath, David had many, many deep, dark, low valleys. In fact, David is on the run from his father-in-law, Saul, who is king. Saul loved David and everything about David until jealousy crept in for Saul. And all of a sudden, people are recognizing Saul as this mighty warrior king. They're recognizing David is this mighty warrior. That God's hand was upon David and it was recognized. And so Saul the king becomes very, very jealous. And it gets complicated. Right? You think you've got drama in your family? You think that, that your family is, 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 is a little bit rough or you feel like, like maybe your family is dysfunctional a little bit at times, or maybe a lot at times. Well, David's own father-in-law is trying to kill him out of jealousy. And not only was David married to one of Saul's daughters, but David's best friend was Saul's son, Jonathan. So this is just a complicated scenario. David, at a certain point in his life, actually finds himself fighting for the Philistine army, the army that he fought against. He finds himself as uh, somewhat of like a mercenary soldier fighting and just, I mean, can you blame him? He's on the run from Saul, the king of Israel, who is just, is, is so jealous and angry, trying to kill David. So David finds a little bit of refuge in, he finds a little bit of refuge for about, about 12 to 18 months in a place called Ziklag. And he's in Ziklag and he's living somewhat peacefully. And, and he has a group of warriors that surround him, that are there with him, about 600. And so they'll go out, they'll fight different battles, acting almost like mercenary soldiers. Well, they come back after fighting and they come back to Ziklag and they find that Ziklag has been destroyed by the Amalekites, perhaps in retaliation to some of earlier battles. And, and in Ziklag, it's destroyed. And not only that, but David's family has now been taken captive. And these men that are with David, that are fighting with David, all of them, the, the grief and the pain just uh, strikes them in a powerful, powerful way. And it, but, but then it turns where they become very 
angry towards David. Hey, this is all your fault. If we weren't out following you and fighting these bad, it, this wouldn't have happened. We left our own family, our own people unprotected. They get so angry. They turn so quickly on David that they are at the point they want to execute David. The story turns out better where David is act, they're able to go. They're, they're able to recover the captives and David encourages himself in the Lord. But it's at this moment of great pain and grief that many scholars believe is the context of Psalm 13. David is crying out in desperation. And he says this, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long are you going to hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? Having sorrow in my heart daily, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes. He says, otherwise, lest I sleep the sleep of death. In other words, God, this is going to do me in. God, if you don't intervene, I am not going to make it. I will not survive. He says also, verse 4, my enemies are going to rejoice. They're going to, they're going to say, I've prevailed against him. The people that trouble them, they're going to rejoice over David's demise. But verse 5, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath dealt bountifully with me. Today we're going to talk for a few moments from this psalm, and we're going to dissect this psalm and read through this psalm and we're going to talk about the hope that grieving hearts can have. David is at the point he's grieving so heavily. Verse 2, it says, it's a, daily, it's a daily sorrow in his heart. Right? It's at the point now, it's just, it, it, it's depression. It's, it's just a grief that's overwhelming to David. And I think that maybe today, there's a lot of us that can relate to that. To the overwhelming grief in life. The pain in life. And sometimes it, it seems so overwhelming. Grief is such a powerful, powerful emotion. And it's real and it's raw. And David here is experiencing that. But David's not alone. I think about different prophets that we read about in scripture. I think about even even the writings of Paul and how Paul talked about a continual sorrow in his heart for his people. And Paul talked about the point where he was oppressed and afflicted and he was cast down. But yet he knew he wasn't forsaken. He wasn't destroyed. But we can see this all throughout scripture. The people that we look up to as, as people that were close to God, that loved God. And, and why do we think that our life will be any different? Why do we think that we're going to be shielded from that grief, from the pain of living in this fallen world? And the reality is none of us will be shielded completely from that. That all of us will come to a point. Maybe you're at that point now where you're crying out to God, how long? How long? David keeps asking this question, how long? He feels like he's been forgotten by God at first. Does God, how long wilt thou forget me? But then it gets worse. He says, oh Lord, forever. Then he says this, how long are you going to hide your face from me? So it's one thing to feel like you've been forgotten. But it's another thing to feel like you have been intentionally abandoned. And this is David's feeling here. See, this is real. It's raw in this prayer to God. And as I mentioned, David's not alone. We read some of the prayers. I think about the prophet Habakkuk. About three years ago, we studied through the Old Testament book Habakkuk. The prophet Habakkuk cries out with similar language. And, and basically he says, God, how long is all of this injustice going to go on and you do nothing? Now that wasn't true that God was doing nothing. It wasn't true that God had abandoned David and forsaken or forgotten David but that's how David felt. That's the real raw emotion that we see in David. And this 
prayer, the, the, the psalms, many of these psalms were prayers. It ended up being songs. You probably heard the, the phrase that the, the psalms, this was the hymn book of the early church. They would sing these songs. Many times pray these same prayers. David's asking God, how long is it going to be? Then maybe today you, you find yourself asking that same question. God, how long is this sorrow going to be here? How long is this overwhelming grief going to be in my life? And everybody in here, that grief, it's, it's probably because of a different cause in the sense of like every situation's unique. Right? You, you may be grieving heavily over just missing someone. You, you grieve over the death. You grieve over the death of someone. Maybe you're grieving over someone that's living, but it's like they're dead because they've abandoned you. They've forsaken you. They've, they, they, they've walked out on you. They don't want a relationship with you. Maybe they don't extend forgiveness. Maybe they're the ones that have caused the offense. And, they, and because of that, there's that, that distance and that tension. And you grieve continually. Maybe you ask yourself, God, how long? How long is this going to go on? How long is this battle going to rage? And, and he says, how long, verse 2, shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? So now it's like the anxiety builds up over how long am I going to feel the way that I feel? How long am I going to have this continual sorrow in my heart, this grief, this depression? And maybe you can relate to that. Sometimes, the, sometimes you grieve, you grieve over the fact that you're just anxious about how long you're going to grieve, how long you're going to feel this way. And this is real. This is raw. This is the emotion that David has. He says, how long is this going to be? How long will I have this, this sorrow? How, shall, how long shall I take counsel in my soul? Having sorrow in my heart daily. How long shall my enemies be exalted over me? So he's saying, not only is, does he feel like God's abandoned him, not only is he stressed and, and, and anxious over the, how long this grief is going to be in his heart and how long he's going to have these, these feelings of sorrow, but now he's saying it goes a step further. There is enemies that are going to use this to mock him. There's his enemies that are going to use this to point, ah, he finally got what he deserved. Maybe you've experienced some of that. Now, thank God, during sorrow and difficult times, we have one another. We have fellow believers to go to. Man, I know that has been just such a, a blessing personally to me of, of so many people, so many of you that, that, that just the friendship that we have and the bond that we have, the encouragement that we have. But look, when you're going through difficult times, not everybody is just there for you to encourage you. Sometimes there's people that will use it as an occasion to mock you. Sometimes they'll use it as an occasion. Oh, you finally got what you deserve. And David's fearful over this. Saying, look, the, my, my enemies are going to use this as, as an occasion to just mock me. He says, God, please consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So... He's fearful, fearful that God's abandoned him, right? He's sorrowful that he feels like God is just ignoring him. He's, he's grieving over the fact that he's grieving continually, his own emotions, his own heart. He's grieving over the fact that there's others that are going to throw this in his face and mock him and use it as an occasion against him. But now you see this, he says, God, consider and hear me, O Lord my God, consider and hear me. It says, consider me. That means to look on me, God. Don't turn your back on me. And once again, you see this, this tension in these Psalms. You see it all throughout the Psalms, right? Where you, you hear these prayers of faith, these prayers about God being the rock, God being the shelter, God is his hiding place, God is his shield. God's going to fight for him. And yet, sometimes it's within the same chapter. The prayer of God, where are you? How come I'm calling out and you're not there? God, how come you've abandoned me? How come you've forsaken me? And what I love about this is just the raw, honest emotions. And you know what? 
it seems like God's okay with it. Like, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but you see a lot of these psalms, the psalmist, and a lot of times it's David, and sometimes it's other writers, they just go off on God in their prayers. But the worst thing you can do is not pray. See, God can handle your open, honest prayer and your open and honest emotion. In fact, God wants you to come to him. See, sometimes what we do is this, those thoughts that we have of abandonment and betrayal, those thoughts that we have about what God has done or what God hasn't done, we express them to others when we need to be expressing them to God. God can handle that. And sometimes it's okay to just go to God with your real, honest emotion, a heart of, of honesty with how you're feeling. Because many times that prayer of lament, it's really a prayer of faith. Because though you're being honest with God about how you feel, you're being honest with God of how you feel towards him. You're being honest with God with how your own emotions are right now. There's always a turning point when you keep going to God. And this is what happens with David. David says, God, I feel like you're not hearing me. I feel like you have forsaken me. But God, please consider and hear me. God, please don't turn your back on me. He says, oh, Lord, my God, not just consider God, look at me, but hear me. God, please hear what I'm saying. Then he says, lighten my eyes. Now, this possibly could mean he's saying, God, make your way clear before me. I need that light to see that. And I think that's definitely part of what he's saying. But I think it's even deeper than that. When he's saying, lighten my eyes, enlighten my eyes is this, God, put that light back in me. Put that hope back in me. God, give me hope. And when you're grieving, when your heart is sorrowful, when your heart is depressed, what you need, what I need is to have hope. To have hope. Because so many people today are overcome by a feeling of hopelessness. That, that grief and, and depression, they are false prophets. Because they tell you it's never going to get better. They tell you this is where you're going to get comfortable. This is how you're always going to live. It's always how you're going to feel. It's always where you're going to be. But they are false prophets. And David is recognizing this. And he's saying, God, please consider and hear me. God, lighten, enlighten my eyes. Put the hope back in me. He says, otherwise, my enemies are going to say, lest mine enemies say, I've prevailed against him. Those that have troubled me, we're going to rejoice when I move. He says, before that, otherwise or lest, I'm going to sleep the sleep of death. In other words, God, if you don't intervene, if you don't hear me, if you don't consider me and look upon me, God, if you don't breathe this hope back in me, if you don't lighten my way, God, it's going to do me in. Such open, honest, raw emotions. But then we see this shift. As David is going to God with an open and honest heart, a prayer to God, which, by the way, God knows our hearts. Why do we feel like we have to approach God with these fake, pious prayers? Go to God with honesty. Go, if you feel hurt, you feel betrayed, you feel abandoned. Now, you're mistaken. I'm mistaken. We haven't been. But it's, oh, God is okay as we go to him with those emotions. Verse 5, we're almost concluded. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. You see this shift where David is going with a heart of grieving, but yet then that prayer, that lament, that sorrow, it turns into a prayer of faith. He says, but I've trusted in you, God. He says, I've trusted in your mercy. I have trusted in your steadfast, unchanging love. I don't feel like I'm loved. I don't feel like I'm being heard. But God, in the midst of that doubt, I trust in you. I trust in your mercy. I tr My heart is going to rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. He says, God's going to put that song back in my mouth. David cries out. He says, Lord, my God, Lord, Jehovah. That reflects God's promises. God, Elohim, reflects God's power. 
See, David's at a point, remember, he's anointed to be king, but there's a delay. A long, long delay. It's why he's crying out, how long? And David is wondering, is God truly going to fulfill his promise? But yet David, in that prayer of faith, that turn, that shift, he says, God, I'm praying to you the God of promise and the God of power. The God of promise and the God of power. Yes, we have a powerful God, amen? We have a God that makes promises, and he's a God who will keep his promises. See, God is faithful. God is unchanging. God is, the, 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 the term is immutable, that God is unchanging, unwavering. And that can bring us comfort, because our life is the exact opposite of that. It's always changing. Sometimes by, by our own foolishness, sometimes by our own sin, sometimes by our own mistakes, sometimes by the sin of other people. Sometimes just the circumstances in life, they hit you and life changes in an instant. But it is in that instant we need to have that prayer of faith. God, you are, you are God who promises. You are a God of power. David saying, God, lighten my eyes. Put that hope back in me. And this is where the shift in mindset happens. This is where the shift, where that trust in God, I've trusted in thy mercy. My heart will rejoice in thy salvation. See, this faith that God will bring beauty out of the ashes. You see that phrase in so many songs that we sing. Because that's what God does. We see God can take hopeless situations and he breathes hope in us. God can take dead things and bring them back to life. He says, I'm going to sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. As we conclude, I want to just really say a few things. But the main point, the main thought today is this. It is okay and it is good to go to God. With these prayers of lament. With these open, honest prayers. Again, it almost seems like at times, whether it's David, whether it's some of the prophets, like man, they're, they're approaching God a little bit disrespectfully. But you see as they approach God with honesty, how that their heart is shifted. Right? We talked about Habakkuk. Remember Habakkuk the prophet? Right? He starts out, God, how long? How long are you going to do nothing? About all this injustice. But you know what Habakkuk closes out the book? Saying, you know what? The, the fig trees not gonna, may, may not bear olives and the, the flowers may not bloom. But yet, I'm trusting in you, God. In other words, God, it may not turn out how I want it to. I'm expecting it to. How I wish it would. But God, my heart is, my heart is going to be anchored in trust in you. And it's okay to go to God with those prayers of, of lament and grief. In fact, I would encourage you to write those out. I would encourage you as you're reading through Psalms to pray these exact prayers to God. A heart of honesty, a heart that's open. God can handle that. In your grief and in your pain right now, the worst thing you can do is to stop praying. The worst thing you can do is to shut down. Go to God with it. Go to God openly with it. Go to God honestly with it. Go to God with that. And then what you'll find is this. Eventually, eventually, you're going to turn to God's unchanging character over your feelings and your emotions. And what we struggle with is that eventually part. What we struggle with that is the how long part. See, I think a lot of us have faith that God will eventually bring beauty out of the ashes. I think we have the faith that eventually God's going to work all things out for good. Eventually, God's going to take the curse and turn it into a blessing. But it's that waiting time that we struggle with, isn't it? It's that deep, dark valley that we're walking through that here's what we wish. I wish we could fast forward through it to the ending. But know this, the valley that you're walking through, God has not abandoned you. 
God has not forsaken you. And God's allowing you to go through that valley. And God will sustain you in that valley. And it may seem long and it may be long. It may seem dark, but yet though the clouds are dark and the, the, it seems like there's no hope on the horizon, yet God will give you hope. God will give you strength. Turn to him. Go to him in open, honest prayer. And maybe for some of you, you've just shut down emotionally. The pain has just been too much. You've shut down to where you're not even going to God about it because you feel why. God's doing nothing. But I challenge you today with this, to write out that prayer of lament and take it to God. And take it to God daily. And take it to God honestly. And take it to God with that raw, real emotion. And see how that God will also shift your heart. How that God is going to give you a greater trust. God is going to give you hope. That God is going to give you belief. That there is a path forward out of grief. Belief that God will bring beauty from the ashes. Belief that God will bring life from death. Psalm chapter 40. I love these words. Psalm 40 verse 1. This is also a psalm of David. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. There's that waited. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and he heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit and out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock and he established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is he that maketh the Lord his trust. I think of Psalm 28 and verse number 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am great and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly, my heart greatly rejoice and with my song, I will praise him. See, depression, grief, they're a false prophet. They tell you it's never going to get better. Your feelings are never going to be better. You're, you're, you're stuck in this cycle, but that's a lie. That God will bring hope into you. That God will bring life into you. That God will bring you out of that pit and set your feet on a rock. Why? So that you and I can sing praises to him. But the challenge today is this. Praise him in that valley. Praise him as you're walking through that dark road that you find yourself in. And you'll see this. You'll see that shift, that that prayer of, of desperation, that prayer of grief and sorrow will eventually turn into that prayer of faith that we see as David concludes Psalm chapter 13. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's pray.